Um, welcome to the Tabletop RPG Freelance Mentorship Podcast Series, um, hosted by Darker Days Radio. I am Crystal Mazur, the host, and today we have a writer interview with Mo- uh, Monica Valentinelli. Hello, hello, hello! <laughs> From um, the frozen north. It is currently <laughs> snowing for both of us, and... Uh, so a brief overview of this series um, and this episode is that I have uh, started doing this podcast series because a lot of writers, when they get into the industry, um, have no clue what to expect or uh, what to look for or anything like that. Um, a lot of them go in blind without realizing the amount of work that needs to be done. And so I wanted to kind of make this a little bit more transparent um, for the freelancers that are coming in or even current freelancers who um, are kind of confused about some of the things that are go, have, or go on within the industry. Um, our goal is to help people who are, in, are interested or curious about freelancing or struggling with it um, uh, or who really just want to connect with both new and um, established writers to be able to do that in a way that is uh, a little bit more accessible than going to conventions. Um, If you are interested, please check out our previous um, episodes, which is Getting Started in Freelancing, Freelance Writer Pay and Negotiation, Contracts and Negotiation, The Writing Process, and then we have several recorded live panels from Gen Con and Gamehole Con. Um, go back to the first episode and watch that if you have it, or listen to it, sorry, if you haven't yet, um, to give context to some of the things that we talk about. Um, and just a heads up is that we actually did this particular recording or podcast, technically, at GameholeCon. It's just I was a bonehead and didn't record it. Um, <laughs> so we are going back and re-recording it. It may be a little bit different if you were at Gamehole Con to watch it, um, but a lot of people, I got a lot of really positive feedback from it, and I feel like this is a very valuable resource. Um, and so, aside from uh, Monica, I feel like um, interviewing much more established writers on their process and everything like that might be something that we are interested in doing in the future. So... Um, with that in mind, please welcome Monica Valentinelli. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, so we are going to move on to our news really quickly. So I feel like we need a sound effect for that. Uh, well, I mean, we do have bumper music. We we have bumper music. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I end up muting myself because I can recognize when I say um a lot, like my voice vocal pattern for um is mm. very recognizable. And so I can also see where I say whoosh. Uh, it's a really good way to edit things. All right. All right I'm going to say it with you then. Ready? Whoosh. Ready? Whoosh. I think I'm going to keep this in for the bloopers. It's funny. <laughs> All right, um, so for news, we usually do a news segment with Darker Days Radio. Um, Here I kind of focus on uh, what projects our uh, podcast guests are focusing on, as well as some of the stuff that I may not get to talk about on the Darker Days Radio podcast. Uh, So, yeah, so Monica, do you have anything coming up for news or anything like that? So for announcements, I usually don't announce unless I have an upcoming Kickstarter or the book is already finished. Uh, Experience has taught me that there are 10,000 things that can go wrong between when something is drafted and when it's in print. So I usually like to wait and be on the safe side there. So what I just had debut this month is an essay about the persecution of European witches and the witch trials. And that came out in Apex Magazine's February issue. Um, actually, it wasn't a February issue. Okay, I'm going to have to can... do... <laughs> That's okay. Like, I, just... I think it was January's issue, wasn't it? It was January's issue. <laughs> um, 
Apex Magazine's January issue, which we will link to with the specific issue number um, in the show notes for you. And beyond that, I was at Game Hole Con, and then my most late, my most recent tabletop gaming RPG release is. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking in hashtag. It's a thing because of Twitter. Is the what was it? <laughs> Crap, Crystal! I am screwing uh, up your podcast. That's fine. <laughs> It um, wasn't cyberpunk. What what was it? It was Was it Cyberpunk though? Now I gotta look. <laughs> Shit. We talk about it a little bit later, so I can always link to it too. It's fine. Okay. I've been teaching workshops and shit, I don't even remember what my latest release was now. Wow. That's... I think it was Cyberpunk. Good. It was Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk Red. Tales of the Red. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um uh so for for me I just uh was able to in, uh announce a whole bunch of different things. So um I am one of the consulting developers for Insert Cool Name Here, which is going to be a open license gaming system um developed by Mark uh I want to make sure I do his name right. Mark Tassin, um, he is he is heading it, and I'm part of the cons- uh, consulting designer team. And then I am also writing on the Black Ballad, which is um, Rick's um, Rick Hines, who was just a guest on the latest podcast episode, um, hit, uh, which is a cleric based setting. And that is the Kickstarter page just did the pre-release. So go and sign up with your email. It'll be launching in March. All right. We're going to move on to our main topic. Can can you tell that self-promotion is not really a thing that we do very often? <laughs> no, not I, no. I'm terrible at it. No, no, we do not do it often. It is very uncomfortable. It is. I I call myself out every time on Twitter. I'm like, I should probably talk about this more. All right. So, um, Monica, you've been in the uh, industry for quite some time. Um, What I'd like to do is give you an opportunity to talk about kind of your background. How did you get into tabletop RPGs and how did you get into writing in general? So. Oh my goodness, that that's like all of the questions all at once. Um, <laughs> yes, I am nearly old. Um, I I was always a writer. I started writing when I was very young, and I went to university for for creative writing. Um, I didn't know what to do with it after I graduated because, but then there's also the reality of like how do you make money and how do you find a job and all of that kind of fun stuff. Um, and I just I knew what I wanted to write. I just didn't know how to make that happen. And I fell into gaming very accidentally because there was a small press publisher. And this was, I want to say, 2004-ish. Abstract Nova Press. They were a small press publisher. And they were posting open calls for a game called Nuominon, which was inspired by Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. So it called to me (laughs) in my literary background in a way that uh, I was like, well, this sounds pretty fun to write. And what what the open call was for was you designed a room with fairies in it, and I, traditional fae, where it's, you know, that very frenetic dancing around the table and whatnot. And yeah. I had a ton of fun writing up this room, and then I ended up writing on that game and went on to work on Exquisite Replicas and a couple of other games for them before some of them, which never got published, um, and then went on to, to do other things. So it was very it was very accidental and very cathartic at the same time because I am the type of writer who loves to write for an audience. I love to write with people I love to collaborate um and and think about things in different ways and I felt like gaming was really this great 
place to scratch that itch, but but also think about things differently in terms of narrative. Um, game writing is very different from fiction writing. It's because the player motivations are at the table, um, whereas the character motivations are static and on the page. So it, it's very it's very interesting, and I really enjoyed it. Did, did you know that, that your first RPG was actually the first one that I run demos with at Gen Con ever? Uh, no, I did not know that. Yep. Holy shit. <laughs> That's pretty wild and synchronous. Wow. Oh, did you have fun with it? I did. I I absolutely loved running it, and I thought that the way that the they set up how to do the rooms and move from them was just really cool. Also, the the system which uh, uses yeah. dominoes is yep. fantastic um, and extremely accessible for a lot of people who don't like dice. Oh, I didn't even know that. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I mean, because at the time, right, like we. We were just starting, and I say we as in, you know, the thing about the gaming industry is that there's so many different com- companies and so many different people, but yep. I yeah, remember the are. conversations about accessibility were not as prominent as they were now. Yep, but and we can get into that later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, totally, but but I just liked it because it had giant bugs in it. Like, I just thought it was ridiculous, and, and sometimes when I like to work on things, I like to be ridiculous because why not? Um, because I have two sides of my brain. One is the super deep, dark side. And the other side is fluffy bunnies and rainbows and glitter bombs. And that kind of split the difference for me where there was like this mystery and you just play these giant bugs in a silhouette rouge. And, you know, a lot of people really like the dominoes, but I didn't even think about it from accessibility. That's pretty wild. Um, because normally especially after working on games for this long, I'm, it's not necessarily that I'm embarrassed to look at my work from previous times, but I, I tend to try to take the approach that I'm always trying to grow and change from one project to the other, even though, you know, I don't always accomplish that goal. Sometimes it's just like, oh, well, this didn't work out as planned. Um, but other times, you know, it, it's really a joy to like kind of look back and be like, yeah, you know what? My heart was in the right place and everything just kind of came together. So I'm glad that, I'm glad that it's accessible almost 20 years later that, you know, it's something <laughs> that people uh, people could use. Because, yeah, I mean, dice and, I mean, I remember those conversations. What's a 10-sided die? I don't understand that. You know, when you're talking to people that are normally, like, playing Scrabble and whatnot, they're used to, like, yeah. six-sided die. They don't understand that dice come in all different shapes, but... Thankfully, thanks to Dungeons and Dragons, now I think people understand that there are all different kinds of shapes, including ones that are shaped like Caltrops. Yep. The Caltrops ones are dangerous. (laughs) More dangerous than Legos, I would like to add. Way more dangerous than stepping on Legos. Not speaking from personal experience or anything, but... Uh, so, like, backtrack just a little bit. How did you get into writing? Like, what is your interest in it, and what is your background of, with writing specifically? It doesn't have to be tabletop. Thing. I mean, writing specifically, you know, I remember when I was – so I was an early adopter for reading. Um, I started reading very young. I was, like, three or four. And I remember writing kids' books even in – first stories I ever got published, I was, like, eight or nine. And it was a Halloween story. It was called Ella's story. And I was like super excited, you know, to, to write this story. I was like really into like the Halloween shows and just really enjoyed it. Um, at the time, I was also reading a lot of Stephen King, which if you know anything about me and about Gen Xers, I mean, the fact that a lot of us read Stephen King when we were young explains so much. Um, <laughs> so, so much. But I remember writing, it was a frame story, which is a very popular style of story where, you know, you have, um, often available on Netflix, where you have the ending or you have the main character of the story in the beginning and then they do like a flashback and then, you know, at the end of the story, uh, it kind of catches you up with like a little bit of a twist. And I I remember um, I was so proud, you know, honorable mention in the newspaper and got published and everything like that. But 
um, it, it was, it was hard to find my way because I didn't really understand, you know, and I still didn't, even when I went to college, the difference between literary and genre and why there were all these, you know, turf wars about different types of writing, which I think are less so now, but, um, but writing was just something that came pretty naturally to me. And it was just something that I really wanted to explore. I, I remember very specifically when I went to college, I was, I was very concerned about getting a job, you know, super concerned about it. So I took all different kinds of writing. I took tech writing, um, business writing. I remember I took poetry. My, one of my mentors in college, late Ronald Wallace, um, you know, he gave me one of the best pieces of advice that I just kind of stuck to, which was, you know, all that shit they teach you in high school about writing and you start adding all these prepositional phrases and whatnot. Just skip all that. Just tell the story you want to tell and then add in the stuff later if you really need to. So, you know, the whole idea of word conservation and writing simply and straightforward um, was something that I had started honing for a long time. And that was a really good fit with gaming because in gaming, you often have to take very complex ideas and try to dis distill it down within a framework in order for your audience to understand it. Uh, which is why I'm also pretty judgmental when it comes to reading instructions for things. I'm like a little bit of a tyrant. You know, if, if I read instructions for things and I don't understand it, even after the fourth or fifth time, I'm like, who wrote this thing? You know, it's just like, you get super judgy after a while. But but it, it's a bit like when you, it's a bit like if you, you know, play any sport or, you know, if you're a knitter. I'm a terrible knitter. So you could probably like look at a scarf I made and be like, oh, God, she dropped that stitch. And I'd be like, what's the drop stitch? Um, but it's it's a little bit like that. It's not meant as a slam on the writer. It's just, you know, coming from that perspective. But, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty opinionated about um, teaching new people to play games and also writing things in a way that's clear for people to understand. And I, I think that. Sometimes people think, well, you know, it's it's not as dense. If it's not as dense, it's just not good writing. And I'm like, eh, it's just a different style. And my style has always been towards word conservation. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um. So coming from that, I know that we kind of mentioned Cyberpunk Tales of the Red um, a little bit. I wanted to kind of touch upon that in a little bit more in depth and um, let you talk about like your writing process and insight into the writing um, because cyberpunk, uh, some of those things are really hit home right now and other things are still kind of far out there. Yeah. Um, like where, where, what did you draw in, uh like inspiration from or like where did your stories come from for this? So, so hilariously, <laughs> and I say hilariously, so anytime I'm writing for something, um, one of the things that I do now, and it wasn't always the case, um, one of the things that I do now is I'm always looking for a point of connection, right? Like, how can I connect with people and make this emotionally compelling in a way that um, is not a way that I might feel is emotionally compelling? Because sometimes I'm... Sometimes I write because I want to see if something works, but that doesn't always work in a game or in a story, right? It's like, that's just stuff that, that goes on my desk or trunks or whatever. But to connect with people in an adventure and to make it emotionally compelling, to get that emotional reaction, I often look for, to real world inspiration or, or things that, you know, really just, oh my God, I can't believe that's actually a thing. That's actually a thing. Oh yeah, maybe I can use that. And so I was watching fantastic and he was talking about how there were ransomware hackers for wi-fi enabled devices where hackers would hack into um your devices and then just basically not turn them off and the particular episode they had it was let's just say it's more adult rated than i want to get into here but some pretty terrifying devices that hackers were using ransomware on and that's literally what gave me the idea for my two-part adventure series. I was like, well, what if, what if, oh, what if somebody took advantage of the ransomware or the, the cyber 
software that you were using. In this case, it was um, an augmentation package for to look like a vampire, where you know it would cool your blood and these things would extend or whatever to force you to kill people. Like that's terrifying to me. That somebody could remote control something that you augmented yourself with for fun uh, to be able to do that. So that that was literally the inspiration behind that. The other inspiration behind that, and I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, it was Goop. It was Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop, and specifically a water bottle on Goop that was like a ridiculous. It was like eighty dollars or a hundred dollars or something like that. And what it was is it's a water bottle, and on the inside of it, it has um, like a rose quartz crystal or something, something like that. And it's supposed to be imbued with all of these magical benefits and, and blah, 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 blah. So I added this other component to it um, because, you know, corporations are evil in cyberpunk um, about how they were just selling tap water and calling it like this refreshing cactus water. And it's so great and fantastic and better for you than this regular water you just really want this plain tap water essentially um because i think there's when i think of cyberpunk i think of corporations taking advantage of people's emotions and really diving into the marketing aspects of it but also the other side of it which is the criminal aspects of it um and then the other thing i thought about was well who did I want to be part of the story? And I decided to um, tap into an underexplored aspect of cyberpunk, which is the homeless kids. And part of the reason why I wanted to do that is because um, I wanted some of them to be the heroes, but I also wanted it to be something emotionally compelling where you want to help them and they want to help you. But you have to figure out how to build trust because these are kids in a community that um, are being unfairly targeted and being blamed for a lot of stuff that they didn't do. And that's literally the point of this story is you're trying to help, you're trying to help the helpless and you're trying to stand up for them in a way that maybe most other runners wouldn't. Um, and that's where, it all started and then from there I just went completely just bonkers with the setting things that I thought would be super fun um there is a sushi restaurant in it with um, a Himmy cat game mechanic that thankfully Aaron and Mike and and the team were were very very uh fun I got the chance to do the art notes for it but um I really put a lot into it and it was something that it was it was something that was really fun, and I really enjoyed doing it. And I'm just grateful during the development process um, that they, you know, retained my vision but refined it for what they needed for the book, which is something that often happens in gaming. Yeah, I I feel like cyberpunk has um, a lot of that marketing stuff um, is a, like an oversaturation, and it's also a reflection of it's so much that we just tune it out. And they could be telling us the truth about some of this stuff, and like we wouldn't even care because yeah, we wouldn't exactly. be listening to it. I mean, exactly, right? Like it's 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 a Minority Report where Tom Cruise's character is walking into the mall and he's got new, you know, he's got the new eyes. It's not a spoiler; it's been out for a while. Um, <laughs> but he's walking through the mall, right? And like all the ads are hitting him, and um, and they're hitting a different name because he has a different set of eyes than his normal eyes. So it's not him specifically anymore. And it, it just, it's very jarring just how personalized and targeted the advertising comes. And after a while you become desensitized to it. You don't even realize it. Um, which is part of the reason why I also added something fun because I didn't want it to be super, I didn't want it to be so dark. It was unplayable. Um, I think yeah. sometimes gaming experiences, right? Like, you get into these really deep topics and if it's not the right group it, it can it can be very gut wrenching and very awful to play so i added you know like a band and um you get to like you know navigate the crowd and go through security and it's like a real all that fun stuff too but yeah in the background it was it was really hitting home to what i thought cyberpunk was um which is about that yeah. about that marketing trying to sell you something even 
when they're not trying to t- sell you something. Yeah, and I feel like the the, the homeless kids are also going to be a really good juxtaposition because they're not the target for most of that stuff. And so no. they might actually see right through it and be like, uh, are, are you guys even paying attention to any of this stuff? No, and, and so so it's funny that you should say that because that was one of the reasons why I gave them a home. And I put the home underground. Um, and the reason why I put the home underground is because there are tons of stories in our real world about people living underground for safety and in communities and whatnot. And people don't even know that there's people living in underground communities in the cities that they're in. Yep. Um, you know, so, so giving them a place to call home, I was also hoping would give them some autonomy that they normally wouldn't have. Because I really didn't, I don't like to be mean to my characters, but sometimes, you know, you have to describe things that are really awful. And I wanted to give them some autonomy so that they could protect themselves and be a strong community that the players would have to work with instead of the players building the community for them to live in. Like I wanted, yeah. to, you know, I wanted that different take on it. No, and that's, that's really a awesome thing to see. Like I, I, a lot of people don't realize just how underground some cities are. I mean, like with with Justin Files and stuff like that, they mentioned Chicago, left, right, and center. By the end of that series, you know that there is like stuff that that it, it and that's actually true. But like locally for me, Milwaukee also has that too because we have the Deep Tunnel Project. Um, and if you don't think that people aren't living underneath there, you are sorely mistaken. <laughs> um. So, like, looking inward to your own communities and stuff like that, that's a really good reflection of the real world and how uh, we, how surface we think versus how other people who live in the reality that they do think. So, yeah, yeah, and and I think for gaming, you know, the the point of being in a game, especially when you are not um especially when you're diving into a venture it's sometimes that's part of the reason why i suggest playing the stuff that people write because when it comes on a page it's a little bit different right because you're reading about what might happen in that adventure but when you're working with somebody who's running the story and you're role playing a player uh or you're role playing a character whoever that is in that environment and in that world and you're experiencing it for the first time, I do feel it's a very different experience than just reading like a couple of lines worth of text. So yep. there's something to be said for skilled um, people running games as well. And and I think that um, giving them the ability to tap into a lot of different notes means that it may be a very different experience depending upon the group and who's running it and what they find compelling about you know the story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I am going to shift a little bit um, to a different game that you've worked on and one that you were a developer on, uh, which is Hunter the Vigil. Um, that has also recently come out. Um, mm-hmm. If you haven't checked it out, it is for the Chronicles of Darkness line. Um, it is a uh, fantastic update to the the original Hunter game. Um, so I want you to talk a little bit about your development process for that because that was that's very different from a writer process, and um, what your like overall goal or vision was for that project. So Hunter the Vigil, the second edition, um, was a game that I wanted to work on because I had worked on first edition in a, in a couple of different ways. I worked on Mortal Remains. I worked on. Um, another adventure that I can't remember the name of right now. Um, but I I had done some first edition Chronicles of Darkness stuff, and I really wanted to do a second edition book. Um, when I originally pitched it and when I spoke with Rich about it, um, you know, he was very clear that Hunter the Vigil first edition was a beloved game that didn't need a significant update in the sense that, you know, we didn't want to change the game. We didn't specifically want to change game, gameplay and whatnot. Um, and the idea was, you know, we want to do 
we want to do a second update right, right and we want to provide new materials. So um, I will tell you that I was late and that um, I take full responsibility for being late. And part of the reason why I was late is because I had decision paralysis very specifically about what can I provide you as a player or a storyteller that's new because I didn't just want it to be just another rules update. So um, going through it, we um, we put the slasher chronicle in it, um, which means that you were getting so a story and a campaign setting that was very much inspired by the, the very popular slasher supplement. Um, but the game itself, I put way more material in it than what was in the core book because I didn't have the opportunity to do like a compact and conspiracies uh, supplement type length. So, you know, I'm writing on the popularity and the, the love and the just the deep respect for this previous game. And I want to do a really good job. So I had a team and my team is the reason why, you know, I will always say that on every game, no matter how much work I did myself. Um, but the, other people working on the game are really the people that brought it out. And um, I hired Alan Turner. So Alan Turner is a BIPOC uh, game designer. He's also a professor. He's just, he's just an amazing guy. And we had a conversation about it. And I said, well, I said, one of the things that I would like to make space for in this game is an indigenous compact, a modern indigenous compact. And I told him, but that's not the only one that I want to do, I said, could you please write all of them and not just that one? And I left, left let it be his choice. Um, but the reason why I wanted to do that is because of tradition and I wanted the ability to create a group so that I respected the space and I gave the time. Um, and he did. And, and, you know, I gave him free reign to do it. I said, whatever you want to do, let's just try to make it work. Um, I told him what I needed. And he came up with the Sworn Compact, which is a group of hunters that don't try to kill monsters. Instead, what they try to do is contain them because they think of them as a natural part of the environment. And I learned so much when we did that. And what was really interesting about it was that Sworn in particular, it enhanced the game because it gave hunters a different take on it, right? Like it, it's a different way to think about monster hunting. So even if you didn't use that compact and you had them as NPCs in the background, it immediately changes the tone from every single time you go out with a monster, you have to do a specific type of approach to dealing with them. It's like now you have more than one approach. Um, and that's always been the case, mind you, because, you know, especially with the different tiers of play and whatnot. But I just felt it added a different nuance to it and really gave people more options and opened things up. Um, the other thing I did is that um, I read the forums obsessively. And some people really wanted tier one style of play. So at tier one, it's just a cell. It's just you and your buddies going out there, holding the vigil up against the night, light that candle, right? Like you, you're not connected with anybody. It's very frenetic. It's very dangerous. You don't have any resources. I'm trying to give them more support because if that's the style of play that you want and that's what works for you um if the rest of the game is particularly focused on compacts and conspiracies then you're not going to get as much out of second edition so i did expand and clarify a bunch of things and built um some connections and lore into hunter society in particular um and then i had a fantastic team you know the thing about the 2e mechanics is in particular is that um, I went into it knowing that I wasn't the expert, and I always like having a rules editor on every game that I work on because I always know somebody is going to know more about mechanics than me. Um, and I, I take that approach with everything because I feel like with gaming in particular, the best possible game that I can present is one where I have experts who work with me. So I had that <laughs> in this game. I had people that um, 
Megan Fitzgerald, who you know went through and added um, a wonderful, wonderful mechanic uh, called Touchstones, which grounded hunters in the real world. So Hunter emerged as this enhanced style of play where, yeah, you're the underdog and you have to toe the line between the connections in your real life. So if you wanted to, you can bring your families along. You can have friends in the real world. But then at night you face this darkness. And what do you do? What sacrifices do you make? How do you how do you manage that? Um, and with Hunter, the other thing that I like about it personally is hard choices. Um, that is something that I try to put in a lot of my games because I think it makes for compelling stories, um, especially horror games. You know, not if I'm writing something for fun, but but definitely horror games because those moments are the ones that you remember the most. And ultimately, even though it was late, all the problems um, and whatnot that we had, I'm very proud of what the team did. And I will stand by the team because ultimately it wouldn't exist without them. Yeah, and I feel like um, like that's something that's not talked about a lot, which is that sometimes in the development process, you get stuck. Um, and that can cause some problems with timing and release issues and all of that stuff. And it is, I, I'm, I'm not going to say it is a normal part of development, but it is something that does happen often, more often than we talk about. Um, and because so, it's kind of, it, because it's, yeah. um, it, it's, sorry, that was the wrong word. Um, because it's, it, it's not. How can I put this? I believe that failure is interesting, right? It, it's a it's a motto that we had when we were working on fire, the Firefly line. Failure is interesting, but I also think that it's interesting in real life to draw from. But when you're in the moment and you don't realize that that's what's happening, you freeze up because you don't want to lose the project. You don't want to not get paid. You don't want to make an ass out of yourself. You know, all of these other sorts yeah. of things. And 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 you know, it's gonna happen. <laughs> the, more, the longer you work in any industry, or the longer you do anything, it doesn't matter what it is. You are going to make a mistake. You're gonna fuck up. Um, you're gonna clash with somebody's personality. It's just a thing that's going to happen. The question is, how can you resolve those conflicts, and how can you move forward from that um, in a way that doesn't put yourself down, doesn't put anybody else down, resolves the issue and moves forward. Like how fast can you pivot really is the question. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the universe of things that make a project late don't have anything to do with what's going on with the game. And yeah. I, I think the hardest thing is to admit when we are wrong, because I, I certainly don't want people to look at me and be like, oh my God, she fucked up. Yes, I fucked up, but I also did all these other things right. Yep. I mean, I have I have also fucked up on projects, and I absolutely understand that. Um, and uh, that is something that I am continually trying to be better at as a person. It is recognizing I definitely failed at that, and what did I do wrong, and what do I need? For myself in order to not to do that again <laughs> and sometimes it's beyond your control you know like health yeah, issues and, I, and stuff like that you can't control that no but other things that you can control it should be a reflective process well i think it gets even more complicated because of social media right because oh yeah we have so just as an example um we have access to customer service departments you know, for, for things in our day-to-day -day life. Yep. You get a wrong size, you get a crappy shipment, somebody screws up their shipment. The only time I ever post about it on social media is if I really need an action taken and I have exhausted all other options. Because I don't want to make some CSR, rep, you know, a customer service rep's day awful. Like, I'm not going to run to social media to, to just shit on somebody who, you know, is trying their best just to put food on the table and have a fun job and figure out what their next steps are um, or whoever they may have happen to be. Um, I should clarify. Sometimes when I 
am having a bad day with somebody, I try to imagine a person and a human being and I give them a little story that I can empathize with. So I am not a shit. You know, she's whatever. Um, Crystal, you can tell. Oh my God. I'm so embarrassed now. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, I, so the thing that I, I, <laughs> so like, um, like recent controversy, my whole big thing with all of that, well, with the tabletop industry, um, with WASI is specifically is that um, at the end of the day, we live in a capitalist hellscape that has uh, specifically made things trickle down where the lowest paid employees are generally the ones that are the customer facing people. And so you kind of have to go through and and reflect upon that and how you <laughs> uh, interact with people. Um, uh, when it comes to, like, developers and, like, stuff that's late, it kind of still applies, um, but not really. Like, it's one of those that's kind of like a cafe in between. Well, it's it's weird, though, because something that you touch on, which is something that I think about often, is power dynamics, right? Because, like... Yep. Using using the using the Wasi thing as an example, it's an illustrative example. So I am a hundred percent sure that when they went into changes to the ODL, they did not know what kind of reaction they were going to get because they had a specific goal and they had a specific reason why they wanted to change it. And, and I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to say that it probably wasn't for the um, small press or the independent designers who just enjoy making games that are not rocking, you know, million, two million dollar Kickstarters. I, I'm yeah. give them the benefit of the doubt on that. I think it's something different. But I don't know that for sure. And when all of this stuff happened, the, from experience, I have had a number of situations in the gaming industry where I've heard a thing, a thing went viral on Twitter, it turned out not to be true, right? Like, until yeah. I get confirmation, it's really hard for me to believe a thing, only because of Phil Reed. And so I was the marketing director for Steve Jackson Games, and Phil, I was doing a lot of conventions that year, and I kept running up to him with all these things that I heard multiple people right so i'm doing my due diligence i think it's true because i've talked to multiple people etc he's like you know what monica here let's do this and we went and we talked to the person who actually knew what was going on and had an actual conversation with them which we could do because we were on a you know when you work in marketing you're kind of on the trade side instead of the creative side trying to verify a whole bunch of stuff. And it and it turned out there was a hint of truth for what was going on, but it wasn't the full thing. Yep. And ever since then, that's how I think of things, right? Like, by the time something goes viral, whatever the truth was gets lost between all these different types of discussions. But the other issue with that, though, is that um, people need to have the discussion. So you never want to tell them not to, and I never want to tell somebody how to feel. So all of these discussions are happening. And for me personally, I can't really have an opinion until I know what the final decision is going to be or where it's actually going to go, right? Because yeah. I figured if it was a draft, even if it was a leaked draft, that there were going to be changes. And sometimes when you do a draft, you do the crappy draft first. And as somebody who always says, it's okay to write a shitty first draft, I d I just, it, it wasn't that I thought poorly of them. I felt like they didn't understand the power dynamic at play. Um, yep. And then I saw that some of the employees were getting harassed and, you know, pictures of them, like their kids, this and that. And I, I just felt like it went too far. Yeah. Um, because the people that are in power aren't going to be the people that you interact with on social media. They're not going to be names. They're not going to be people that you normally deal with. And the decisions that they're making, you know, if a whole bunch of people are screaming about a thing, sometimes the tendency is to just, it's, it's either to back down or it's to not listen. It's 
usually one or the other. Um, yeah. And I was very concerned about which way it was going to go because at the time I was like, oh my God, you know, I don't have enough whiskey for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it going to go like this way or the other way? I don't know. Um, and, and I didn't, right? Like, because I, I'm, I don't work for Watsi. I don't know what's going on in the freelancing side. I'm just a freelancer. I can speculate, but what good does that do? What good does yeah. speculation do? It's just another voice on the pile. Um, I did say how it was a, how I was affected and how I'm looking at it, which was, um, you know, whether or not it was affecting me personally. And, and the thing that I didn't say publicly, which is which is true, because I announced it at GameholeCon, you know, I've always wanted to do a Ravenloft campaign on DMs Guild. And basically, I was like, well, maybe I should just wait and see what happens. It's going to look like what form where I'm going to sell it if I should like reskin it as something for myself. Um, et cetera. But, but, you know, it's, it's those types of decisions, but the people that are involved are the ones that I care about because in gaming, it is a lot of work and every single time something blows up, it just makes things 10 times harder because we do this for fun, right? Like, even though we get paid for it, we, if it wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. Yeah. Like I, I absolutely do this for fun. Um, but and like I like this, I've said this before, but this is like a part time job for me. But I advocate for not it being treated as a, you know, um, oh, it's just a frivolous thing what they do or a hobby or anything like that. Because there are people who do this full time who need the support of all of the others that are doing this part time. Because you should be able to make a living off of game game design. And writing yep. and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. So treating it like a hobby um, is is not something that I do um, or try not to do. A very very hard try not to do. Um. So yeah. Okay. We kind of got off on a tangent a little bit. <laughs> I, I think we needed to though because I think I, I don't know about you, listener, but I think everybody in the audience was wondering what we were going to say about that. So so there we cut it. I yeah, like I I have a lot more thoughts on it too, and I might end up just doing a vent session, whatever for it. But um, yeah, there there are a lot of things that I feel like now that things have resolved. Um, yeah, I don't think they have. <laughs> I mean, like so, I, tangently, yeah, like surface so, level res, res, uh, resolutions. Surface level resolutions. So so one of the things that I I do want to I do want to point out. And again, using that as an illustrative example, but certainly there's been a number of them. It is the fact that the you know the relationships damage in the process. Oh yeah, there absolutely. Are, there are a lot of relationships damage. We are a relationships based business. Yep. They compete in publishing, and it doesn't matter what you make. I don't care if it's paintings. I don't care if it's nonfiction books. I don't care if it's novels. It's people and damaging relationships take a long time to repair and rebuild. Yes, they do. Um, and I am absolutely not, and to be clear, I am absolutely 150% not excusing um, anything on the corporate greet, you know, from the corporation's point of view or whatever. The fact of the matter is my opinion matters very little because I just don't know what the fuck happened. Like, I just don't know all of the details. And yeah. people that do can't talk about it. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that I think people need to understand too. Like when you are an employee working for a company like that, that you can't say it's shit. You can't say anything because you're gonna, you're afraid of getting fired. You're afraid of um, getting sued. Yeah. Like the legal backlash. So there's a lot of considerations there too. So I guess the reason why I'm suggesting empathy is because somebody is always profiting off of our rage. And um, even when it's righteous and justified, you know, where does it end? At what point are we going to be happy? And what decisions do we need to make for ourselves? Yep. So. All right. Um, so we're going to shift conversation and stuff like that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your, it was a, a free RPG day game, right? The One Night in the Catacombs. Oh yeah, no. Um, one night in Bane House is how it started, and then I released One Night in the Catacombs after that. 
that. So I wanted you to talk about a little bit about the inspiration and stuff like that, because this ties a little bit back to some of the other things that you have a personal interest in or have personal ties to. So Awesome. So um so one night at one night at Ben House is a it's a micro RPG that I submitted to the level up anthology published by Ninth Level Games uh for twenty twenty two. And it is a two to three page RPG completely encapsulated where you start the game in your pajamas and you go into your house, um, you go into this first room and there's invisible statues of the house as you play it together as your group. Um, you can put on costumes, there's monsters you can fight, but it's completely self-directed. It's empowering the player to tell the story. You don't necessarily need um, the tour guide. I, in the expanded edition, I put rules for that. And what it is, it's based on the um, the Roman myth of the genus loci where every house is a spirit and has a very specific theme for that one, uh, which is French. And then I went on to release a standalone expanded edition with a slightly different flavor, which takes place in the catacombs in Naples called One Night in the Catacombs. And in that, uh, you actually help repair the house spirit. Um, and it goes into a little bit more depth with rules and whatnot. But um, but yeah, I was inspired to write. I was inspired to write it because I really love the idea of when we create space for people, that space has a spirit. Whether it's our communities, our houses, our cars, etc. Like, how many of you have named your cars? Oh my God! Um, so I love right. the idea that you narrate and create the house as you explore it because. Sometimes I feel like when you're in a dungeon crawl in a traditional RPG, you already know that something is going to be there, right? Like, it's going to be a trap or, you know, it's going to be something beneficial or whatever. Like, you're exploring what you think is already there, but removing the fact that you don't know what's there and you're creating it on the fly, um, I think makes it more tense, but also more fun because you can help each other. Or you can compete with one another. It's completely up to you. Um, there's winning, different win conditions for the game. There's just a lot of different things that you can do with it. And and the full version is 100% me. It has a lot of dry humor. It has uh, very funny <laughs> to me, right? Like funny to me because my humor, my humor is so dry. It's Saharan. It's ridiculous. Um, where I, you know, write different hints in the in the captions for the different illustrations that I used. Um, and I also pointed out um, Mosaic Monday, which is a hashtag on Twitter where um, archaeologists would post different and beautiful mosaics from all over the world that uh, would populate, and many of them from ancient Rome, but also from other cultures where they depict different stories and whatnot. So... Yeah, it's it's a very me. If I had to pick a game that was 100 percent me, that would be it. It's like all of the things all at once. Yeah, I I like the fact that it's building up and repairing rather than tearing down or destroying, which is what a lot of uh, RPGs tend to gravitate towards because of the history and just the thought process behind what an RPG is. Um, and it kind of goes against and challenges that and, like, kind of flips your thinking as a player as well. Well, I mean, so so digging into that a little bit, you know, it, it's not just the history of RPGs. It's the history of games in general because at and stories. So at the heart of anything, there's this idea that there needs to be conflict, right? So So when you have conflict as the basis for your design... The easiest form of conflict is violence. It's just the, you don't even have to think about it, yeah. right? Like there's a monster, I shoot it. So I like to think of games as having multiple different types of conflict. Um, and I learned that from reading um, different stories from all over the world, uh, specifically Japanese and Chinese myth, where the conflict doesn't necessarily have to be violent. Maybe it's social. Maybe yeah. it's um, yeah, coming definitely. up with different types of conflict can still make for a compelling story. 
Um, I feel like even though, and, and I know it's me saying this because I'm always the person asking for more guns, um, um, primarily because sometimes in horror games, my decisions go very badly and I die a terrible, horrible death very early in the game. This is my shock face. <laughs> well, sometimes, sometimes I make the terrible, horrible decisions because I want to see what happens, right? Like, it's, yep. it's like that yeah. inspiration of, oh my God, this is a safe space. I'm with my friends. What's going to happen? And I remember I joined uh, an All Flesh Must Be Eaten game many years ago. Um, and I was, I sat down to play and within like the first round I died, the second round I turned into a zombie. It was great. What's that? I said, I kind of also like the concept of like, if you think about it, when you're repairing that, that spirit of, of that house and stuff like that, it, the conflict already happened with it. And so now you're kind of picking up the pieces and where do you go from there? So it's kind of a reflective of you know, like, how do you move on from something like that? One of the mysteries is, haha, you've been cursed. You have been turned into a monster. Which monster are you? So there's like different layers um, and people can take it where they want. Because ultimately, when I'm providing a game, um, not veering off track again, I promise. When I'm providing a game, I want the ability for people to take what they want and leave the rest, right? But in order for me to do that, I have to figure out how can I come up with options for people so that they can resonate with that are very simple and clear and have interesting objectives. Because in gaming, I feel like some of the best adventures and some of the best games have clear adventures. You know exactly what you're doing at the table. You know exactly what your group is doing. And when, the, when those two things can't be spelled out, and sometimes things get very muddled. Um, but muddled for me in particular, but, but there is a style of game that's like that. That's not the type of game that I'm used to writing. Um, okay, so another thing that you have been working on um, and have been promoting a lot more lately is your writing workshops that you are doing. Um, what are these? What's your goal with them? And what are you focusing on? Awesome. Um, yeah, I am doing a lot more teaching and I'm going to be hoping to do a lot more teaching and. Uh, this year because um, I am fulfilling a lifelong dream and going to Egypt. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. Um, so I have had the pleasure of working with um, author and teacher Kat Rambo, who is a fantasy and science fiction writer. She's a speculative writer. She's an amazing person. And she has the Rambo Academy for Wayward Writers. And I happen to be one of the instructors. And I have um, realized that over the years I have accumulated quite a bit of knowledge from working in gaming, uh, but also some other aspects of the craft. So I have taught tarot for writers, where I show you how to use tarot cards to create characters, build plots, um, think about things in a different way, just trying to unblock your brain with your favorite tarot card deck. I also have... Um, Taught Horan Gaming over Halloween, uh, Game Writing 101, and this February and March, I am teaching how to sell your work online through Rambo Academy, and then a new class, which is inspired by my essay, uh, a deep dive into magic and magic systems for writers through the, the premier um, set of workshops for Apex Book Company. Um, I would say that my, I would say that my Goal. I'm I'm still trying to figure that out because it's been a really great exercise for me to collaborate with a smaller group of people because I forget how much I know, right? Like, because I'm just so used to doing things and I never know how much information people need to have or what they need to have. So when I first started, for example, I didn't have slides and I realized that was a mistake because that was not good for accessibility. It was putting too much on the person, even though the workshops are recorded. So then I moved to slides um, so that, that the slides are backed up with the lecture that they get a video presentation of. And I also include writing exercises because I find that when you, excuse me, when you create, those are the best workshops. Um, I have taught in-person workshops um, about how to create your own language uh, for use in like alien or fantasy or whatever. And those are super fun. 
as well as um, creating our own setting and plot uh, through the Build a World workshop series that I've, I've done as well. And they always work out better for me in person because I can be very hands-on. So the video has been really stretching some of my abilities and helping me grow in that direction. Um, the other thing that I really want to do with these workshops is empower people to find their own path because so many people take these workshops and they don't realize how much they know how awesome they are <laughs> what they want to do is possible how much i believe in them um and i really want the ability for people to come away from the class just feeling better about life and that you can go do the thing and it's okay to make mistakes um and that there is a path forward and it's your journey and you want it and you got this. So that's that's ultimately what I want to do. But on the flip side as the instructor, I am also learning as well, which is which is I guess a benefit for me. <laughs> so so teaching uh speaking from a teacher standpoint, um one of the best things that you can do is actually have your students teach stuff to other students. Uh, because those students will actually learn a lot more from them having to teach and explain things than you as a teacher could ever explain to them and get them to understand and comprehend. Yeah, we um to that to that point, we always have comments open and that's and, and I try to have a discussion period, but I like yep. that you frame that so I'm, I'm writing this down. Did you hear that listeners? I am learning from a teacher. <laughs> Um, and, and that's also why I like why I'm doing this podcast too is because I'm also learning stuff. Um, so yeah, like I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. I don't want to know everything. Well, um, but but I always want to continue to try to keep learning, and that's the big difference. So here's the biggest f you that nobody tells you about when you're like five. You never stop learning and you never nope. know everything because your perspective always changes, right? Like gaming is so different from <laughs> from when I first started. Um, and I think about all of the things that have happened just change-wise, technology-wise, et cetera. You know, you pivot, you pivot or you leave is basically yeah. your two options. Um, yeah, so you, you just never stop. There's always something new to learn. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to shift away from games a little bit into a couple of topics that you have wanted to touch upon. Okay. Um, uh, these are things that um, you are continually advocating for in your social media and also as a developer or a leader on projects, um, which is one of the things that, um, that I know um, kind of took us I mean, we've been friends for quite some time, but it did take us a long time to learn how to communicate with each other. <laughs> mm. um, and, uh, but once you figure out, like, and I, I struggle with communicating with certain people um, and, like, not taking it personally or not taking it um, and internalizing it and turning it over and over and over and over and over and over in your head. Um, and that's something I still work on. Um, but there are essentially, like, there are multiple communication styles, but the, the two that I kind of um, picked out for this is, like, the direct communication, and then there's, like, a flowery or, I'm, I don't want to say indirect because it's not quite exactly the opposite. It is more uh, like a narrative communication versus a succinct very quick and to the point type of communication. Yeah. And and like <laughs> um I am I used to be very, very direct um when it come came to a lot of things and having to learn how to like not write in a direct style for things like narrative writing um was something I've worked on. Um and also not rambling because I tend to do that too. <laughs> So, um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? What are your perspectives? Some of the things that you have ha have had challenges with with this? Hmm. Um. Quite a bit. So, so one of the things that I learned about 
myself is that um, I'm neurodivergent, which is which is great. You know, it's like you you always learn things about yourself, and you always hope that you learn things about yourself. But I have always viewed words, and this has been true for as long as I've been a writer, as containers of meaning. So I look at language as something that's incredibly complex and not everybody's communicating the same style or the same way that we expect them to. Um, so sometimes I don't really get hung up on a specific word that people are using unless they're being a jerk. Because most of the time, people are picking the best word that they can at the time, and they're not really thinking about it, um, especially verbally. So like verbally and in, and in conversation exchanges, when I can read the person's facial expressions, um, when I understand them a little bit better, you know, I tend to give more people the benefit of the doubt, um, especially with things like body language. So uh, one of the things that I learned from neurodivergent Twitter, which is amazing and really wonderful to read people being very open about their experiences and whatnot, was, for example, things like, um, you know, traditionally, a lot of people think that if you talk to somebody and they're folding their hands across their chest and they're very short with you, that they're miserable or depressed or unhappy or defensive or, you know, just this long laundry list of things that are attributed with somebody who's very negative. And what I learned is that, you know, maybe that person is very, has, suffers from social anxiety. And it's not that they're trying to be negative. It's just that they're hugging themselves. And that's why they're folding their hands um in front of them and whatnot and i know you and i have had these conversations before yeah um, and they've really helped me as well so so the first thing that i think of is not the specific words that people are using in person co communication but what are they actually trying to say um and sometimes that can be very hard which is why i like to ask a lot of questions especially in in-person now I have found this is very difficult to do online because when you ask questions online and you want to try to find out what some somebody is saying, um, that ends up turning into 7,000 explanations of what you don't know. And it's not that I don't know things. It's that I'm trying to communicate with that, that particular person to try to find something out. And I don't need Bob and, you know, his great aunt's dog and the hairdresser and the cousin and everybody else to chime in. Um, <laughs> so so I find communicating online very difficult unless I make authoritative statements. And I've also found out something very interesting as well. Sometimes when you ask questions online, even if, when you come from this place of learning, some people think that, um, and, and it doesn't matter what people think, mind you, but some people treat that as you are insecure or you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I, I, I'm not a fan of that because... Online communication is very difficult. So when um, when I was in internet retail, one of the things that we had to do was, was keyword research. And, and I found out that through keyword research, the most popular version of a word when people put them in search engines is the singular version of the word. So even when it's shoes, it's shoe. Even when it's earring, something that's normally plural, it's earring. And it's because when we interact in an online space and we don't know that there's another human being there because we can't see their face, we're not interacting with them personally, all the text that's coming through, it's just information. We don't recognize that there's human beings behind it. So then, because it's information, we want it to be correct. And so then it becomes this very isolating experience. And I, it's very hard to recognize community for me on in public spaces, unless I'm in a specific Slack or Discord or something like that, where it's an actual community filled with people. Um, otherwise, it's just like, we'll get up on the soapbox and say something. The other thing that I see too is that I, I'm very direct in email because I don't want to waste anybody's time. I feel like I can add a whole bunch of your awesomes and smiley faces and other things like that, but I'd rather just get to the point of what I need to share in order for this project to continue. And I've changed how direct I was because I did get quite a few people thinking I was like this monstrous bitch, really, um, because I didn't add enough smiley faces. 
And and I find that very funny um, because I felt like at the time I felt like, well, this is just the equivalent of telling me that I don't smile enough. Um, but I can see like if you're dealing with email and you're used to a certain style of communication that, you know, you need something like that. But there's so many funny nuances to email communication. Like some people think best means fuck you, except I was using that all the time. And it turns out that some people in Britain thought best meant fuck you, but the Americans were fine with it. So it was just this very complicated thing. So I started adding warmly because I was like, I'm not telling you to light yourself on fire, but I mean it with warmth. Like how, how else do you end, you know, like an email? Um, but ultimately with style, I think that style c- will continue to evolve and change, especially in our communications. But um, But here's another thing I noticed too, is that being neurodivergent, one of the things that I was doing that I really have to stop myself doing is that if you tell me a story, my first, the first thing that I want to do is show you that I care and that I'm listening and that I'm active listening and that I'm empathetic. And the way that I did, the way that I did that primarily and still do sometimes, like I'm trying to be better about it, is to share one of my stories. And it's not because my story is better than yours or more important than yours or trying to eclipse how you're feeling it's literally because i just wanted to show that i was listening to you that i had that experience too and we had that point of connection so i had no idea i was coming across as a monstrous bitch <laughs> until until somebody told me and i think that's the other thing too is that with with communication we have to remember that our culture, our background, our professions, um, you know, just our day to day, the friends that we have, the city that we're in, all these different things affect the communication, especially um, in a world where, you know, microcultures are popping up by the hour on different yeah. social media platforms. Like it is ridiculous how fast communication spreads. So if I use an out of date term, and I've been using it for a while, it might take me a while to change. Like, I'm not going to get it on the first try. Um, But I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best. So it's very interesting that you brought up, like, the whole you connect by sharing personal stories, because I do that as well. And it took me forever to realize that people were viewing it as me trying to hijack conversations, which is not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was trying to be like, no, I empathize. I understand. I went through this similar thing as well. Um, and so I do feel like there is there's there's definitely a point to to that where it's taken the wrong way when it's done. And I but I also feel like in in the opposite vein is that people have to understand that sometimes that is how other people connect to a story. Because if yeah. I cannot relate it to a personal experience of mine, I'm like, oh, I am totally lost. I've never had this happen to me. So it's it's a two-way street, right? Because you have to be aware of maybe empathizing or sharing a story is not exactly the right moment or the right time where you can ask, hey, can I share something, a personal experience of mine? Um, but on the other hand, other people have to recognize that that is also how people connect. Um, so it, you know, it's it goes both ways. Yeah, and and to your point, I think I think here's the thing that really sucks about this com- conversation in general is that there is no right answer because it's always going to depend upon the people and the situation involved. Because there are going to be, unfortunately, it's sucks ass, but there are going to be some people you cannot work with. You cannot communicate with them. You cannot get through to them. You just don't understand each other. It's just not a good fit. It doesn't mean that you being neurodivergent or they being neurodivergent are terrible people. It means communication fails. And we suck at dealing with failure. We suck at resolving conflicts um, and not understanding how best to communicate feeds into our ability to resolve conflict. So, you know, the entire thing about communication, I mean, my, my God, you know, reading neurodivergent Twitter, so much that people have to do and the things, it's a lot of work just to be who you are. So yeah. yes, absolutely. Compassion is necessary, 
but not at the expense of hurting other people. Yeah. Right? Like, um, because there's that side of it too, where some people, you know, they're like, well, you know, this is just how I am. And, um, you know, if it hurts other people, it doesn't matter because this is just how I, no, <laughs> that's not the answer. Yep. Um, to belong, we all want to get along, but I don't think most people go into it trying to hurt other people. Like, I do believe yeah. that there are people that, yes, they're problematic, but the majority of the people out there, I think they're just trying to figure out, you know, what is the best route. And we're embarrassed to be wrong. Going on and looking up some like studies and stuff like that for a different project. And I came across an interesting communication study uh, Mm -hmm. where they had an individual clap out happy birthday. Okay. So the song happy birthday. And the person could internalize the song in their head. They knew exactly what they were clapping and they could hear the song Happy Birthday as they clapped it. But when they went and they did that, where the person had to clap out Happy Birthday without singing it, mind you, there was no music or anything like that. Only 20% of the people that they did this with were able to figure out that it was the birthday, Happy Birthday song. Wow. And, like, as as a musician, musician, and I know you can also relate to this as well, like, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, I hear patterns and stuff like that all the time. I should be able to recognize happy birthday being clapped out. And that's not necessarily always the case. Happy birthday is one of the biggest known, like, most well-known, at least within American culture. And so for only 20% of a, of a studied population to be able to recognize that the rhythm flapped out is very interesting as a way of communication and seeing how our communication is as humans. Piggybacking off of that um, and bringing back around to writing, one of the things that um, you were saying about the happy birthday song made me recall how I found out I was different. And it was because of Gene Wolfe. I was sitting on a panel and Gene Wolfe was talking about his writing process. And he was mentioning how he can't listen to those playlists of all these beautiful songs that they listen to um, to be inspired as they're writing about their main character, kicking ass or, you know, this really awesome section in this adventure and whatnot. And I can't listen to music with words either. In fact, I have a go-to song. Long. It's Weightless by Barcone Union. It's 10 hours long. Um, and I also called Forest, which allows me to, it's a Pomodoro style app, which allows me to set different time increments. But you grow fancy little trees. But I can't listen. The minute it has words in it, I just can't write. I can't think of the words that I want to use. And whatnot. like I need to be able to, um, I need to be able to really think about what I'm doing before I do it. Because I often write my first draft in my head. So by the time I sit down to the computer, I'm doing, you know, I'm recalling what I was thinking about in the first draft to be able to write it. Um, but yeah, it's, but every writer's different, right? Like there's some people that could, you know, write at a heavy metal concert or in the middle of an airport and they're fine. But yeah, that's not me. Yeah, I can't, I, if, if there is words, it has to be um, un, uh, unintelligible words. Like, mm-hmm. I cannot be able to decipher them. Um, oftentimes, I'll listen to music in other languages, or I'll just listen to instrumental music. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. there's <laughs> so, so when I was doing the Cyberpunk Red, I found this awesome, awesome, uh, wonderful YouTube channel. Uh, Momo, Mr. Momo is his name. I, I need to remember the specific style, and I will make sure I put that in the show notes. But it was inspired by... Um, an artist and a whole bunch of people have been doing these really awesome mixes of martial arts movies and um, Japanese music um, with techno. So it's like this really okay. awesome blend that, you know, was perfect for what I did. And every once in a while there would be like the whoosh of a katana or, you know, somebody <laughs> um, coming in, which was super fun for what I was writing. So I, sometimes I think, things that way for mood but generally yeah not not words for me yeah i do soundscapes a lot um recently it's just really been like the hobbits and hobbiton um (laughs) 
where it's just like the same like two songs on repeat for like ten hours because then my brain just tunes it out and t- and sh- and shuts off the music, but there's still stuff that in the background. So mm-hmm. okay, um, so I know that you have been working on building like a Discord community and working on building up your community through social media, specifically through. Um, Twitter, but also with your website and your um, newsletters and stuff like that. So what are your thoughts on like building a community and how do you go about starting that? And why is building a community kind of important for free? Yeah. Do we, do we have like eight hours? So (laughs) we don't, we don't. No, we don't, but we don't, but we're going to try. No, we're not. Um, So it means different things to different people. What it means to me is that a space where you empower each other to be successful and learn from one another so that you become better people. And that means something very different to different people. Uh, Even the word better people, like what does that mean? Something about ourselves all the time. There is no training manual to be a creative professional in the year 2023. Nobody tells you how to manage your shit on Twitter. <laughs> Nobody tells you, right? Like you, you have to yeah. analyze all of these rules. The idea behind having community, whether that's a community in your hometown or a community online or wherever those multiple communities, wherever those may be, is that you impart lessons to one, one another in a way that is uh, helpful and in a way that doesn't talk down to you for not having the same experiences that or background that somebody else has. Um, I think the best way I would describe it as a community is a is a waypoint on our journeys where we all come together and share stories about what we do. There is a universe of knowledge that freelance anybody who's working contract right now does not have, um, and it's because Things on the publishing end of things and the company side are changing all the time in response to shipping changes, COVID, um, the price of paper skyrocketing. There's uh, technology changing. I mean, with the virtual tabletop, for example, there's just so much that people don't understand. And when there is a lack of understanding, that is usually a breeding ground for confusion um, and possibly missteps might not know is that when you work on a game and maybe you got a chance to work on it as somebody who really loved playing it or building um you know building campaigns and whatnot once money is exchanged you're a professional like you go from somebody who loves making games as something that you do in your spare time to okay there's a contract now and there's money that That's the only difference is the contract and the fact that you're getting paid. Um, That in itself, there's no training. There's no ramp up. Nobody tells you, oh, my gosh, there's these multiple stages, what to expect, uh, what to happen in a draft. And community, what community does is they help explain and they help mitigate and they give you people to bounce ideas off. So you understand some of that language about what's expected of you. Um, what might be a faux pas, what's something that, you know, you might want to look into further. Um, That said, it is a very scary time for all of our communities because changes in technology are happening too fast for us to keep up. Um, You know, the addition of AI, the idea that AI could write our shit or illustrate our shit and, you know, the years that we spent trying to perfect our craft, that's scary to a lot of people. That's very scary. And nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, Community is focused around people and remembering that people make games. It's not just, you know, this wonderful book sitting on the shelf. There's a team of people that went into that, the layout artists, the people who illustrated the individual um, um, drawings, you know, the proofreader, the indexer, if they have one, the editor, the, you know, line developer. There's, There's just so many different people. And forgetting that is something that I think um, that's when this 
miscommunication happens. This is when we stop prioritizing them. How do you go about building a community? Well, you do what I did. You fuck it up first. <laughs> um, <laughs> you make a mistake. So, so many years ago now, I, I tried. I, I noticed that people were very nervous and very anxious about saying that they worked on games or that they played them or did hobbies. You know, like amigurumi, the, the type of crochet um, where you make those little awesome Cthulhu's and I love those things so much like I have a little I have um, I have a whole army of them yeah I have one of those and I have a cactus and I, I just love it so much like I wish I just had like several more of them they're, they're adorable but people were very embarrassed about sharing this side of themselves and and what people don't may not remember um thanks to what we call the Marvel effect is that being a nerd was not cool <laughs> for a long time. no it wasn't for the it, it longest was, time it was a social faux pas, and you could not be the best self that you could be and just play the games that you wanted and do these things. Um, like, I had friends uh, that, you know, worked for very conservative companies, and they were different people. You know, they went to work. They were a different person. It was a costume for them. And then they would come home, and then they would be able to play. But they never talked about the games that they play at work, never talked about them online, even when, you know, online was just coming to be a thing. So that's what I thought was needed was okay well maybe if we do this event called speak out with your geek out that it would allow people to you know be more comfortable and talk about themselves well some people took that as um people with nerdy hobbies were marginalized which was not the point of the community i was trying to say at all um that was actually the exact opposite what i was trying to do was i was trying to come up with an idea that um did not um, target that or say that they're oppressed. It's just that people felt very shy about talking about their hobbies, and I was trying to figure out a way to do that. Um, but I could see how that came across. And the reason why I messed it up is because I made a mistake. And the mistake was I didn't recognize that in order to think about community, you have to think about somebody other than yourself. You have to think Think about a way of empowering the people in your community. The way that I've been flipping this around is by listening to other community organizers, and I've, I've been doing this for many, many years, um, and trying to unpack different types of communities and whatnot. So when I started, um, when I started my Discord, I wanted to make it a private Discord for many different reasons. But you know, invite only, just start small with a group of people. And the way that um, the Discord has grown is that everybody votes on changes. So everybody votes on changes. Someone in the Discord named the Discord. I gave them different options for, we call it the house of M. So everybody's roommate and house. Um, if, if the style doesn't work for people, that's okay. They don't have to be in the house anymore. They can leave. That is people have really felt like it was a safe space for them because they had a vested say in the community. Um, it, it's not, yes, it's my Discord. It doesn't matter. It's our Discord because ultimately um, we vote on things and then we kind of move forward from there and we're very, very slow to build. And I think communities, um, sometimes people forget that communities may, you know, form organically. In gaming, we have a thousand different communities that you probably have never heard of. Sometimes they're formed around systems, games, publishers, designers. Um, but sometimes they're, you know, formed around an identity or a fandom or a specific experience or a convention. There's so many different communities. And as a freelancer, you need to find your people. You need to find your community. Um, but recognize that you can be in multiple communities at once and figure out what's best for you. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Like if you don't want to be in a specific community, maybe it's not a great fit for you. Maybe you need to go to a different one. Okay. Like, it's your journey and your story. And that's that's ultimately what I am trying to do is to make spaces and create spaces where people will feel empowered to learn and ask questions without feeling like, you know, you're stupid or um, you don't know a thing, but also that we share in each other's successes and we're happy for one another and we're not thinking about it like a goddamn competition. Because really, 
we are not competing with one another. Um, there's enough pie for everybody. And it, when you are not aware of that, it can feel like you're competing for that one piece of the pie. There's enough pie. That's what community helps you figure out is that how to get some pie and how to share it with other people. Yeah, I, I, one of the biggest things that I didn't want to do was that when I, when I first got it, got into writing, um, I had a lot of friends in the industry already and I did not want to like compete or look like or feel like I was competing with them. And I feel like it was very helpful advice that you actually gave me, um, which was to look at it as a, you celebrate other successes and you, compete against yourself which you know like that means you set goals for yourself and it should be goals reflective of you not I want to do what Monica is doing or I want to do you know what XYZ writer is doing it's I want to do this this is where I'm at right now and this is where I want to end and then I'll set new goals or you know I will so it was super helpful for me to be able to do that because I really didn't want to, like, get into that mindset because it's such a hard place to be. It is. It is. Because 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 ultimately what you're trying to do is imposter syndrome, in my opinion, comes from a place where it, it comes to a story. You have stories in your head about the people that you admire. And it doesn't matter who it is that you admire. It's, it's anybody that you admire. Um, and when you emulate them in a professional, like you get the contracts, the money's exchanged, et cetera, there's a part of you that wonders if you're good enough to be part of that story. So then the compare contrasts start coming in where you start comparing, contrasting yourself to your peers and to other people because you're feeding off of those initial stories. Um, and I think that you can take back control by setting goals for yourself that you are comfortable with that are not based on anybody else's definition of success, but ultimately things that you can control. You can't control awards. You can't control reviews, but you, you can control the blank page. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so we are going to wrap this up a little bit. Um, so one of the things that I like to do at the end of all of my podcasts is that um, we'll share like either the biggest piece of advice um, from all of this or some of the biggest takeaways. So because you are my guest, I'd like for you to go first. Um, okay, so so do I have a digestible takeaway that you can have from all of this? I would say that my digestible takeaway is that no matter what you want to do or who you are, you are on a journey, and that story matters, and that only you know and sure it is that you're taking, and that's okay, and that's the person that I want to meet. I want to meet the person that can tell me those stories. So own it. Don't be afraid of it. Sometimes you're going to fall down. Sometimes you're going to turn around. As long as you keep getting back up, you're going to be all right. And I feel like my biggest takeaway on this is that um, you should never stop challenging yourself to do new things. Whether it's building a community after literally fucking up, um, or or like <laughs> writing writing in like new systems or in new ways or anything like that, or flipping your your thoughts on um, your preconceived notions on a game system, flipping it around and challenging yourself to do something different. So, yep, personal growth. <laughs> Yay, personal growth. Okay, so um, I this is now your chance to plug any social media um, that you would like, and I will also have links in the show notes to all of the stuff that you provide. Awesome. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to 
listen to me and I I hope that you know even if we've never connected you get a chance to play games and have fun because ultimately that's the reason why we do what we do um no matter what right so online because my name is ridiculously long I you can find me usually as books of m and I have a link tree with all of my links available on my Twitter for as long as that lasts it's been a little buggy for me lately um but you can find me at booksofm.com as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, Monica, today. Um, I appreciate you redoing our panel at, at GameholeCon. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I hit all the right notes because, you know, GameholeCon was uh, was several months ago now and uh, before the winter started where I did not turn into a cave troll and have been... <laughs> Drinking lots of hot chocolate and avoiding, um, you know, there's been oh. no sun, so avoiding. There it. has been no sun. It's been awful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's been like a year without a summer, right? Like the the yep. the Mary Shelley Frankenstein, which means that no, I am not writing Frankenstein, but it just made me. So <laughs> All right, um, and I am uh, Crystal Mazer. You can find all of my social media links at thegeekypanda.com or on almost all social media at Body and Soul 152. Um, I want to thank Darker Days Radio for hosting this podcast series. You can find us all on social media. Um, our email is darkerdaysradio at gmail.com. You can email any questions or any sort of feedback or input there to me, and I will get it to you or get it from you. Um, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Darker Days Radio. And you can find us at Darker Days Radio on Instagram, Tumblr, on Tabletop, YouTube, Twitch, and our Discord, which I also have a channel um, specifically for the mentorship series. So if you have any questions, you can also join us on there. Um, and maybe I'll answer them. Ooh. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much again, Monica, for joining me and, um, we will see everyone later. Goodbye. Goodbye.